In summing up that, I could say that uh, we, we had a veritable potpourri of, uh, of advice from our panel, perhaps uh, ranging at this end of the table from lessons in leadership and evolving through to uh, lessons from, uh, from history uh, and the difficulties of trends analysis and, uh, and prediction along the way. Let's open up for uh, Q&A and you can tap into uh, to the panel and uh, we do have the microphones uh, here still, uh, so the usual rules. Nam, we'll start with you. Uh, Nam Ewan, Australian Defence Force Academy. Uh, Admiral Stavridis is, um, is a big proponent, a big supporter of this idea of open source security. Things like the HAD HADR operations, capacity building and strategic trust development. Do you think we need a, a fundamental shift in the way that we focus our naval efforts to building in that diplomatic sphere and rather than focusing on the kinetic effects of navies, particularly in times of uh, austerity, fiscal austerity? And this is directed to all the panelists. Well, I am first and foremost a warfighter. If deterrence fails, I have to be able to do that ugly, kinetic, hard stuff that is unpleasant. And if I can't do that, I would also argue I can't deter. So uh, this uncertain world, I mean, just thinking of the number of trips Churchill made to uh, Germany, uh, you know, it's a flashback to uh, this business of how interconnected sometimes argues that we won't have another war for X amount of years. Uh, I get paid to, to think worst case as well as the best case in that range in between. So I have to have ready forces to cover that full range of military operations. I can't ignore the business of being able to uh, deal with uh, threats that are below that high-end war fighting business either so one of the things I preach a lot on is the business of having flexible, adaptable capability in order to be able to apply it to where it makes sense, but not being so rigid in what I develop and how I train and what have you so that we can't take uh, what might look like as only a high-end solution and not apply it to other things. Because I can't go the other way. That piece I can't go, I can't necessarily deter, well, I shouldn't say necessary, I can't deter without real capability. But as you look at the uncertain future, you can't just look at today's capability and say, is that going to deter tomorrow's war? You have to be, in my opinion, thinking a bit outside the box, connecting the linkage. That whole business of <laughs> assessing so that you can work to have adaptable plans as well as adaptable capability, adaptable thinking. Well, I mean, I, I would, I would uh, actually agree with, with Admiral Haney. I mean, uh, there are, you know, if, if the Navy doesn't do is, and is not competent at doing its warfighting tasks, nobody else, nobody else can do it. And so that, you know, as, as, uh, as Professor Grove was saying, I mean, that, that really is the bedrock. That is the real bedrock of naval capability upon which everything else, everything else rests. Now, of course, that having been said, as a matter of course, if you look at what navies do on a day-to-day -day basis, year-to-year -year basis, full range of tasks. But if, if a navy loses its competency in, in, in war fighting, there's nobody else who can pick up this slide. This is going to be very boring for you because I agree with Admiral Haney too. Um, <laughs> it seems to me that it's pretty clear that the first task of all the world's navies is national security. Um, and although I'm a great advocate of the fact that all navies on an operational level have a common interest in defending the global trading system on which our peace and prosperity depends, you just have to think of what the consequences of a, 
uh, even a small war between, let's say, China and Taiwan would be, for everything, everywhere, would be hugely impacted by all of this. And so uh, the task of navies is to make sure that doesn't happen, and that it, you deter it. You don't just rely on global economic interdependence. But in the meantime, having done that, you can then get onto the business of protecting against all of the, the other kinds of unconventional threats like pirates and drug smugglers and people smugglers and all the rest of it. That has to be the priority. And as, as um, Thomas just said, if navies don't do it at sea, nobody else can. I agree with them. But just to make the point, though, that it does make some challenges for, your, for, your, uh, for the balance of your fleet. Um, Australia does have a very significant patrol boat flotilla, which it uses for constabulary duties up in the north, because there's a lot of challenging, uh, 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 important challenges up there. And the patrol boat flotilla, which isn't desperately combatant, but does in fact have, is, is and might in another country belong to a coast guard. But for, I think, very good reasons in Australia, you don't have a coast guard, I think, because navies can do a lot of this very well, and it provides something for navies to, to, to do when there, when there aren't higher level operations to be carried out, which hopefully is most of the time. The United States, for its own legal and historical reasons, has a coast guard. Japan has a coast guard. Came, in fact, the navy, the modern navy, came out of the coast guard, the Maritime Safety Agency. And I find it very interesting that the Japanese often use their coast guard in a, in a diplomatic role because they'd rather have a white and blue ship doing it than a grey ship because it doesn't raise the same kind of stakes. Um, the Irish navy is a coast guard. Right. It is not, in fact, a competent navy. Uh, and it's quite self-consciously a coast guard and is quite proud of it. Um, and, and so on. And certain navies are, shall, shall we say, are coast guards because that, on balance, is what those nations feel their best investment is in. But I think for a country like Australia, and a country like the United Kingdom, and so on, and all these, all these middle-ranking powers, uh, the, the navy has to be primarily a war-fighting navy because the threat of fighting a war keeps that situation of relative global stability, even though we might be sailing into, ba into bad weather, uh, a, a, a relative global uh, stability, which allow allows navies to carry on the, their day-to-day -day things. It d might mean you can't have as much of something because you want something else. But remember, a, a, a small Royal Australian Navy coastal patrol boat would have a hard time dealing with a concerted missile attack. Yeah, I, I'd just add the point, though, that, um, which is absolutely right, and it, it, it builds on Eric's point about the fact that this comes at a cost. I mean, there's something out there in, in, in the harbour at the moment, a Type 45, which is awfully good at high-end high warfighting, but costs a hell of a lot of money. Mm. And if you spend money on that, you, you can't afford to have patrol craft. So you can't have command opportunities for people like you. So there are choices. And, you know, it would be nice if we could have everything, but you, you just can't. A point made by uh, Professor Dibb this morning. Next question. Uh, sirs, Midshipman O'Hara from the Australian Defence Force Academy. Uh, throughout the Sea Power Conference, there's been many uh, talk about Navy's ability to deal with non-traditional threats such as criminal activity. But Professor Grove brought up a good point that one of the main focuses in Mahanian sense of the Navy is uh, sea control or sea denial. Um, my question is then, if criminal activity poses a great, great threat through our oceans to our national security, does sea control or sea denial concepts apply to criminal enterprise? And if so, is, is it ethical for navies and military forces around the world to use rules of engagement of sea control to engage non-state actors? Can I start with that? Um, in principle, no. A pirate is a common enemy of mankind. Right. I've often wondered, I wouldn't mind being a common enemy of mankind, <laughs> but a pirate is a, com <laughs> is a common enemy, enemy of mankind. You can, in fact, really take what action you wish against it. The, the, the point comes, of course, when you have to justify that in your domestic, in your domestic law. Um, in fact, we have had something like a convoy system, haven't we, in the counter-Somali counter piracy, where ships have been escorted. That's back to the future, isn't it? You know, and so on. So, in fact, yes, I think some of the techniques used to defend ships against, as uh, well, British submariners used to fly the skull and crossbones, against certain kinds of pirate in the past, 
And after all, the German submarines in the First World War were breaking the rules of war and engaging in what some people might have said was piracy. Um, you know, that in fact some of those lessons may have some, um, uh, 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 um, may have some leverage. In fact, and, and, and they are quite, and, and it's quite, I was quite interested to see how this sort of protected sailings thing, you know, the, the was very like, very like a convoy system. So yes, there are some lessons. And, and, uh, and so, it's, it's, so there isn't perhaps this huge disconnect between protecting merchant ships against non-state attackers uh, who are in it for the money uh, uh, as compared to uh, protecting merchant ships against state actors who are in it for the medals and the glory. Can I? Yeah, I, I agree, agree with that. But, you know, every time a pirate skiff sets goes to sea of Somalia, if there's a grey thing in the vicinity, it stops. I mean, that's deterrence. That's precisely the same. But you're absolutely right. I mean, a lot of these activities are basically constabulary, which means that they're determined and shaped by law. And you have to accumulate evidence in the same way as you would a criminal activity on land. It is a, there is a real tension there. Especially if you, you know, you're on a deployment or something, you see a pirate activity, you get engaged in it, you know you have to go and give evidence and all the rest of it. It plays the devil with your planning projects and all that sort of thing. But you're right, there's a real tension uh, between the two of them, and we shouldn't forget that. And there are lots of lessons, in fact, from the slave trade here, actually. Because what used to happen is that when the, when the warships would come up, they'd land the slaves. And so they'd say, well, I'm not slaving. And you had actually to, uh, to denounce a ship in the Admiralty Court at Sierra Leone, the ship had to be caught with slaves on board. Right. And so they, the, uh, 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 Britain had to establish so-called equipment clauses, which had to be accepted by the flag states of the various states who were engaged in the slave trade, with a bit of coercive diplomacy on our side as well, uh, to, to make sure they did. So that if a ship was found with slaving equipment, it could be taken to Sierra Leone and denounced and burnt as, as, a, as a slaver. So, you know, but you are controlled very much by law, and I think some of the problems which have been faced by Western navies uh, is what to do with these people legally once you've captured them. And, 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 and I know there was a problem for the, for the British ship, certainly, how far did they have to be actually committing an act of piracy before you could take action against them? So there are problems there, ROE problems and this kind of thing, which are in inherent in the situation. Some navies, of course, took rather more robust measures, but we won't mention who they were. So, I think they covered that. Okay, next question. Sirs, gentlemen, um, Lieutenant Commander Carl Jordan uh, from Navy Headquarters, South Australia. Um, my question is probably a little bit loaded in the sense that I'd like to garnish your opinions based on Professor Grove's comments with regarding uh, nuclear involvement and uh, the political debate within Australia regarding the nuclear option, which I don't think has been a mature debate in this country. Your thoughts, please. Uh, you know, unburdened as I am by any responsibility except for you know, my, my, own, my own views, um, look, I think the, the and, you know, this is obviously a, a national decision. It's a decision of the Australian government. But in terms of geography, in terms of capability, even in terms of, you know, what I've seen of the requirements of the, you know, of the new submarine program, I mean, yeah, you're, you, you are talking about a nuclear submarine. I mean, in terms of if you look at the, the design space, endurance, uh, you know, speed and so forth, where that dot lies on that plot, uh, only nuclear submarines have gone. Um, so I think um, that is ultimately a political decision. I think if the political decision were made, and particularly a political decision or a political agreement reached uh, with I don't know. Uh, one of the countries that actually manufactures uh, uh, nuclear submarines, it's actually an ally of Australia. don't know who that could be. Um, uh, if, if, a, if a political decision uh, were reached, I don't, see, I don't think that there are any, there are any operational, I, I think all the operational things could be worked out. Admiral Haney, as a, as, a, as a seasoned submariner, can talk about all the experience that goes into Running a, running a nuclear submarine, the need for nuclear uh, shore power, all things like that. 
Uh, but if there were to be a political decision to do this, um, I, don't, I personally don't see any of those uh, as being insurmountable barriers. I will also say, just in uh, giving a vote for history, uh, of course, um, the, the process that led to the Collins-class submarine actually included a nuclear option uh, way back when. That was actually purchasing uh, nuclear submarines from France. Um, that was one of the options that was explored earlier on in the, in the, in the uh, process that led to the decision to build the, the Collins. Well, as a uh, guy who spent most of my, my life underwater with uh, a nuclear power plant behind, uh, obviously I find great utility. But as uh, you look at it for the Royal Australian Navy, uh, I think it is uh, a uh, piece that you have to look at relative across the whole span not of requirements to ability to afford. Uh, we in the United States have a couple things that are at our advantage. One is we have a civilian, uh, a commercial nuclear power industry that we have, can leverage on, which helps in some regards to keep the costs down in terms of uh, material science and all the R&D and everything else that goes into the physics of uh, just creating a nuclear powered vessel in the first place. So that in industrial base, but more than industrial base, everything else that feeds it, academia and what have you, is, is an investment that has been made over, over time. In fact, uh, USS Nautilus went to sea the same year I was born. So uh, it shows you, not that I'm that old, but I am, uh, how long we've been doing it as a Navy. And we have learned immensely uh, through this journey of hard knocks in addition to what we had to work from uh, over time. And then the expense piece, you have to really look at square in the face in terms of the rigorous training requirements in order to really babysit properly a nuclear power plant. It's not a trivial matter. It requires significant capital investment. And, and I would say, Australia, don't fool yourself as you look at that. Mm -hmm. Or else you will start something you won't complete and then you won't have anything. So uh, that piece of understanding how much national treasure is required to not just, you can't just purchase a nuclear submarine to operate it. You've got to purchase all the sustainment pieces and you've got to work it from cradle to grade. I, uh, as the Director of Submarine Warfare, uh, not too long ago, was responsible for working the requirements definition for our Ohio replacement SSBN. It was the same time uh, as the Pentagon got a bit more religion in terms of looking at acquisition costs. So for that program of requirements generation, we had to also produce our best estimate of total ownership costs for the life of the platform with associated assumptions. So we couldn't hide sustainment costs, mm -hmm. but not just sustainment costs. When you talk nuclear power, there is the grave part of what you do with the beast after you decommission it. So again, these are real things that have to be considered as you make the journey to say, okay, simplistically, yeah, go ahead nuclear. Yeah. But when I say go ahead nuclear, you have to be all in. And this business is not trivial in order to safely and correctly operate a nuclear power plant on a warship uh, across the globe. If, if I could, I mean, you know, Admiral Haney, I think raises some 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 good uh, some some good points. What I'd say, we, and we talked earlier about thinking outside the box, and I think I think it's absolutely true. If 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 Australia were to build that capability, you know, out of out of whole cloth, I think it'd be prohibitively expensive. But again, if we think think outside the box and think about some sort of a consortium, say involving the United States and involving the UK. I mean, I think you know, Britain has challenges with sustaining her nuclear submarine 
fleet. I mean, I, I think, mm -hmm. and maybe I'm being a, a bit unkind, but I think mm -hmm. I think Britain's one, one SDSR away from not having a nuclear mm -hmm. submarine fleet. Mm -hmm. um, so if we think creatively about about those types of, of arrangements, mm -hmm. um, again, and that would be ultimately a political decision, mm -hmm. I think there actually are some very interesting possibilities. Yeah, I think it's um, an example of, of the advantages of being radical. I mean, you can be radical in all sorts of ways. I mean, that's one. And, um, you know, the idea of some kind of consortium in which one kind of mixes um, the capacity to build and support these things is, is one option. Another option might be to think, well, perhaps in 2010, 15, whenever it is, some kind of conventional advance will make conventional submarines much more effective. Another radical option might be to think about where to base them. You know, maybe Singapore? How about that? It's an interesting idea. All those sorts of radical... There, there are ideas out there, so even if you don't go nuclear, it seems to me that um, there are an awful lot of possibilities still. I can see from the top of my street in Blackpool the big building on the other side of Morecambe Bay where we are assembling the astute-class submarines. Um, one problem for the British is, of course, they have to keep up a, a steady drumbeat, as people say, of construction. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, it's very important, in fact, for BAE, uh, Barrow, that in fact we do get a, 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 um, a, a new SSBN, the, which will mean that construction can be, ma can be maintained because a lot of very skilled people are required to make an SSN, uh, both internally and, and, and as, far as, uh, as far as welding the hull even is concerned. Well, that affects other submarines too. And one problem with the Astute program, which delayed it and made it more expensive, was because a lot of workers had been let go and they had to be reassembled. Mm. Um, I have come across at various times from people without submarine insignia on their uniforms a certain feeling that perhaps we invest too heavily in submarines. At the time of the last SDSR, there was the feeling, well, with submariners in charge, what do you expect? The SSN program is unchanged and we lose the aircraft carriers, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. There are opportunity costs in maintaining mm -hmm. SSNs. Um, but on the other hand, we consider, and I think rightly, that having a small force of SSNs, about seven, of which we can maintain, what, four or five at sea at any one time, gives, in fact, a, gives us, in fact, a, an enormous amount, an enormous amount of, of power projection capacity, particularly given the number of Tomahawk missiles which the astute class submarines can, can carry. They've been built for power, power projection as much as anything else. And they are useful. You don't have to, you know, they can neither confirm nor deny if they're there, etc., etc. So they are very useful assets. Uh, m m uh, I can see all the arguments, difficulties for Australia going down the nuclear route, particularly as you don't have a civilian nuclear industry. It creates problems about uh, inspection and so on and expertise, which are, are very tricky. Um, uh, the, but, of course, one could engage in some kind of foreign construction, but, of course, that has industrial implications too, because one of the one advantage of the conventional submarines, I think, is that they're going to be built here, is here, which is, of course, has important in industrial uh, uh, potential. So it's very difficult, but, but if you want a real submarine for the foreseeable future, it's got to be an SSM. Next question. Hi, um, my name is Aidan Morrison. I have a historical um, force structure problem that I'd love to put to this particular panel, um, particularly with the commander of the Pacific Fleet here. Um, my question is, um, what happened to the torpedo boat? Um, and I do have an axe to grind, I should own it, and that's that I, I just, I'm a civilian and I've started a small company trying to bring them back. <laughs> um, but as during World War II, Pacific, particularly in the Pacific, there was a massive crescendo in their use. Um, and I'm yet to hear a very satisfying answer as to why it's only North Korea and uh, Iran that are currently still using them when they seem to me, particularly in literal, literal areas, to be a very cost effective way of affecting sea denial. So I'll start, then you go. Okay, start. All right. uh, I think the basic problem, you just answered it yourself, a very effective means of sea denial. Yeah. Um, we're actually in the means of sea control. Um, it's no good us, <coughs> and when I say us, I mean Australia, UK, US, um, just getting into the business of denying the sea to other people. We're about the business of actually assuring that the good people can use the sea legitimately. And that's the problem. Um, those who are in a negative business of sea denial have the apparently easy option of, of going for torpedo crafts and so on and so forth. And the two examples that you gave are just to kind of il illustrate the point, really. But I think on top of that, there's also a broader general argument between um, naval defense technologists, if you like, 
between those who say what we should be doing these days is to go electronic, if you like, to sort of network lots and lots of smaller units, put them together so that they operate as a single unit uh, effectively. And that makes each element of that, that, that system, if you like, somewhat less expensive, somewhat more um, disposable. That's quite, not quite the right word, but you know what I mean. The other argument says that won't work, that basically speaking we need big, high expensive single units that are in the business of sea control and protecting themselves against small swarming ships like that. I think that argument has been going on for 150 years. Um, so far, the radicals have lost um, in the final analysis. Uh, but I think one of the reasons for that is because it's so very important for the Western powers to be in the business of sea control, not just sea denial. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you want reach of any kind, then you need size for seaworthiness, you need, uh, you need weapons to protect yourself from, uh, uh, from uh, a, a range of threats. It's very interesting how navies that began with fast attack craft, because that's the term we tend to use nowadays because it covers missile boats too, uh, sort of, they soon become corvettes. Look at the Israelis, for example. Uh, because they want something which has longer has longer reach and longer and longer sustainability at sea. Um, uh, fast attack craft can be very useful for countries who are primarily in, uh, concerned with defending themselves, as Jeff says, uh, from uh, from large, you know from the from the major sea powers uh, to control straits and this kind of thing. But even the very early fast attack craft, like the British coastal motor boats, could be massacred by the German naval air force in the First World War. They are very potentially extremely vulnerable. They tend to therefore to be creatures of the night and in the, these circumstances they can be quite useful and sometimes you can have enormous shocks like when a, so, a, a Soviet uh, a, 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 a Soviet missile boat sank the, um, sank the Israeli destroyer in 1967, and everybody developed chaff and this kind of thing. So, uh, it, yes, for certain navies, they have important roles, but they do tend to grow because there is almost a natural tendency in navies to want to have, to want to have sufficient reach. As you look at whatever uh, military apparatus you, you want to have for a country, really, in my opinion, ought to be driven by requirements uh, in terms of what problem are you really trying to solve. Uh, when you look at torpedo boats today, uh, you'd have to come up with a total different concept, perhaps, even in an axis denial, as was just described, because today, you know, the business of night vision, the business of stare down from all kinds of sophisticated equipment, your ability to use it, effectively may, may not be uh, useful in, in your warfighting requirements capability. Uh, that's something that is not the business that's glamorous and, and what have you, but to me it's got to be connected to your strategy. And, and if you don't do that piece right with an open eye to uh, uh, what you're trying to solve in an affordable uh, manner, in an effective manner that has some endurance, uh, you can be building something that looks good, bright, shiny object. But, you know, I was sort of perplexed. You said torpedo boats, and I was saying, boy, in this day and age, I might think about a stealth missile boat. But uh, it seemed like to me we were going in the wrong direction of the speed of war in today's uh, environment. Over. Uh, Scott Bentley, a postgraduate student at the Australian Defense Force Academy. Uh, my accent will probably give me away, but I'm actually not Australian. I'm an American. <laughs> uh, my question is for Admiral Haney, um, and I look forward to any comments that the rest of the panel might have, particularly uh, Professor Mankin. Um, Admiral Haney, uh, in your speech earlier and also um, you know, here this afternoon, um, in, you had mentioned the intellectual component of the rebalance. Um, and that was something I, I wanted to maybe draw you out on a bit more, uh, in particular in regard to Southeast Asia. Um, you know, I've heard from uh, various uh, U.S. officials, including Tom Donilon and um, uh, I think also recently Deputy Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, on the pivot within the rebalance or the rebalance within the rebalance or <laughs> whatever, you know, the term would be, um, but particularly to Southeast Asia and an increased focus on Southeast Asia. 
Um, you, know, you, you noted in your speech the revitalization of the FAO, uh, FAO program. Um, but I was curious, particularly um, in that regard, um, with military education. Um, specifically, I want to point out the, uh, the program at the U.S. Naval War College uh, with Professor Mencken, uh, China Maritime Studies Institute. It seems that we've, you know, there's, there's a lot of intellectual capital devoted to China, um, but Southeast Asia, um, you know, myself coming, coming from the U.S. and coming over here, actually, um, you know, at least within the academic realm, less so. Um, you know, I think we're less strong on, on Southeast Asia, certainly security issues. Um, and so my question to you, Admiral Haney, um, would be specifically in regard to the uh, intellectual component of the rebalance, um, you know, coming to understand the region better and roles for, um, you know, the professional military education within that or, or how you view that. Um, you know, maybe if I could just draw you out a bit on that. And then secondly, I've been greatly impressed uh, since I've come here with really the depth of knowledge um, of our Australian allies, um, in particular at the uh, Australian Defence Force Academy and elsewhere, ANU, um, also in Canberra. Um, but what role you would see for the, um, our alliance uh, with Australia uh, within that as well? Thank you. Thanks for your question there, Scott, uh, and, and for doing what you're doing here. Uh. I think that piece is important. Uh, to me, uh, your, your question sort of evolves around education and uh, for uh, naval officers uh, for this particular region and how does that relate to the rebalance part. Uh, I, I think, uh, it, you know, you, you can't even study China, in my opinion, without studying uh, China's impact around the globe, uh, not just in the region. But when you look at, for example, the immense amount of trade that goes through the South China Sea, Straits of Malacca in the five plus trillion dollars range, uh, there's uh, pieces that, that you have to uh, you know, understand. In order to understand the sovereignty claim friction points, uh, you have to understand the history and, and, uh, of that and the relationship of each country within that Southeast Asia uh, part uh, as well as other areas. Uh, you can't connect the dots. So just because there's a China Maritime Studies Institute, uh, they, they, they are not. I visit them uh, periodically to get some of their, tap into their knowledge. It, it, it's not just about looking at China and China mainland or China first island chain, second island chain, but looking at it more uh, globally. Uh, which, which is important, but I agree with you fundamentally. I, I don't think you can, uh, can study the Western Pacific or sail through it or participate without having a deeper knowledge of the place, and that learning is a continual journey that occurs both from professional education pieces as well as what I like is the OJT piece. Uh, and that's why, as I mentioned in my spiel, is to take advantage of things that you don't get, some wonderful piece of paper that says you graduated from whatever the college of your, or university of your choice, but the learning occurs in a lot of respects by, by going and, and, and participating in the sport in a very communicative uh, and, in fact, inclusive manner uh, to understand the deep, uh, portions uh, of country X, Y, or Z, uh, and, and they're all different in how they view the world through their lens and their interaction. For example, this is perhaps the only trip that I've taken as a Pacific Fleet Commander and haven't gone straight to the embassy as my first point or stop. And in most cases, it's a VTC into the embassy for what I call the 101 touch point, and then I go in for the 301 piece before I even start talking to their Navy leaders or military leaders or government, because to me, we have to have that deeper understanding to go into a conversation. For me to come in and say, well, here's what I think Australia ought to have for their future submarine program without having a deeper understanding of the country's politics and everything else 
uh, would be a bit uh, disingenuous to uh, Chief of Navy Ray Griggs. Uh, so consequently, uh, I think uh, this business of deep understanding is, yes, both classroom as well as taking advantage of every opportunity we can to grow and learn about all parts of the world, including Southeast Asia. Just, just briefly, I mean, the, um, so the, the Navy has uh, established uh, a, an Asia Pacific CANS program, and it's in, the, it's in the very, kind of very early, early stages. And the idea uh, is, is really kind of along the lines that Admiral Haney talked about, not, not, okay, you're going to go to study for two years, and then you're going to be anointed as, a, as an Asia Pacific hand, but rather that you're going to get different educational opportunities uh, th kind of throughout your career to build your expertise. Um, and so I think that actually, that program, if funded properly, uh, 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 will, um, will pay dividends down, down the line. But I'd go even broader. Um, and just to point out that, that Australia and the United States are a well, they're, they're part of a very, very select group of countries. And I probably, if I could count it out, maybe, maybe no more than five countries, in that both of our countries have the ability to bring in immigrants from across the world to make them citizens and, and weave them into the fabric of the society within years rather than, say, generations. And so, um, you know, in the United States, certainly in Australia, are, you know, emigrants from Southeast Asia that are now, you know, part of the, part of the society. That is a precious resource. And I would say just from an American perspective, it's a precious resource that we fall, we fall short in, in tapping into. We, I think we do well, we could do better. Finally, I think you actually, in the second part, you answered your first part, which is, Australia has deep expertise in, in Southeast Asia. And one of the great benefits of the US-Australia alliance is being able to share in that expertise. It's not an excuse for the United States to not build its capacity and its, its intellectual capital. But we're not starting from, from ground zero. And we're, I think we're leveraging a lot of the insights that, that Australia has. And could I, sorry. In, in fact, not just Southeast Asia, but I, I like to stretch it to Oceania, for example. Uh, we don't do anything in Oceania without working with Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, because they're the ones that have been working in that environment uh, for quite some time. So you have to be partners and, and work the strengths of, of our other allies uh, uh, in, a, in a good way. And Australia has been there every step of the way, uh, quite frankly, uh, from from where I see it. It's, it was interesting as I've told some of the team here in, in personal conversations that uh, I got to go to one of your birthdays uh, celebrations in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was stationed there in the Pentagon at the time frame and I went over to the, the party at the embassy, huge embassy, and uh, was blown away by just the number of Australians that came to the party. And I'd say, where are you working at? In all different parts of the United States that uh, they were uh, either liaison or participating formally in a particular program that we were jointly working in. I mean, it, it, it filled the, the same room we were in for the, uh, the last roll uh, gathering after the parade. It, it reminded me of the same thing. And I was just amazed at how many were there doing different things, but that inclusion and working together across multiple spectrums is, is how we learn and grow together. And that was just a, a picture I, I really should have brought here of what that room looked like. Mm -hmm. Because CNO Gary Ruffett at the time frame and I looked at each other and said we had no idea the boots on the ground uh, teamwork that was going on across the spectrum until we had gone to that party and seen them all there together uh, in, in that regard. So. Out of all the countries we work with, uh, from an Australian point of view, we are peas in the pot in a, in a good way uh, uh, across so many different uh, dimensions. Yeah, my, my comments are a very brief one. Um, I sort of teach and research in Singapore quite a lot of the time. Uh, and it seems to me there's a very substantial and very impressive 
uh, US academic engagement in the problems of the region, looking at what's happening in the South China Sea, and in particular, of course. The only slight caveat I, I would add to that is that some of it, at least, looks at Southeast Asia through the lens of the China issue. It doesn't look at Southeast Asia as a region of its own. It's enormously complicated and has huge sorts of internal issues to resolve uh, as much as possibly it should. So is uh, Lieutenant uh, Ben Sweetenham, current navigating officer of uh, HMAS Farncombe. Uh, my question goes to a comment uh, Professor Till made, uh, that was with regards to the fact that you said, sir, um, if, we don't, um, if we don't continue to adapt uh, to answer the question, the enemy will change the question on us. Um, mm. The Australian Navy, like many navies out there uh, at the moment, has been uh, uh, in uh, decades, I guess, of uh, constabulary roles, border protection roles, um, and, and it's been a while since we've been... Uh, in the throes of the high-end warfare that you talked about there, sir. My question is, as navies in, in, across the board, uh, what's the most effective way to measure our ability to, uh, to uh, win in, in that high-end warfare environment should it break out? Mm. Yeah, it's, it really is a substantial issue. How do you measure your capacity to innovate short of actually trying it out for real and then finding out you're not good enough? Um, it's a real problem. It's a general problem that navies are, are large organizations, and like all large organizations, they have the strengths and the weaknesses that go with them. And one of them is uh, what I would call sort of institutional agility. If you look at something like the drugs war, for example, in the Caribbean, um, the US Coast Guard, the US Navy, Allied Navies, and all the rest of it are collectively an enormously impressive resource. They're up against uh, drug barons who, who can react amazingly fast to what they see to be the changing situation. If, if some, suddenly um, their success rate on interceptions at sea goes up, they shift over to air intercepts. They come up with submersibles, which pose all sorts of legal problems and so on and so forth. They can do that because they're less constrained by law. They're less constrained by um, bureaucracy. Um, they're smaller, uh, they're more ruthless, uh, they're not concerned about health and safety and all of these sorts of things. So if you like, large institutions, um, ability to innovate is necessarily and properly constrained by those sorts of things. So the problem is how to actually try and compensate for that. And all I can suggest, really, apart from constant practice, is constant simulation, mm. is, is to red team, is to have your own bunch of um, drug people trying to outwit you um, quite deliberately in exercises of that sort, or coming up with new technologies that can make life really difficult for your helicopters or, or whatever the case may be. Frankly, I can't think of any other way of doing it. And it's not surprising, the nature of war almost necessarily means, if you think about it, that roughly speaking, 50% of the participants in wars through the century got it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, they thought they'd win, yeah. and they didn't. And, you know, the, the success rate, you have to expect, is, 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 is not very high. So Je Jeff, Jeff had his, uh, his favorite uh, Sir Michael Howard quote earlier. I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase mine, which, you know, where he likens um, militaries, navies in peacetime, to a ship sailing through a, a thick fog by dead reckoning. Um, you know, you, you work off of the experience of the past and you sort of extrapolate into the future and you hope you have it right. Uh, more times uh, than not, you actually have it wrong in some way. Um, but if you're good, and when I mean good, I mean you've invested in the intellectual capital, in the human capital, then you have that ability to, to adapt. Mm -hmm. Now you also have to adapt. You have to invest in the, you know, in the technology as well, um, because you know even the even the uh, the best uh, wiliest officers uh, with a you know with, with a paddle wheel steamboat probably won't won't do that well, um, but but it is it is that ability to to adapt and that is is that is supremely an, an intellectual 
task and a human a human task. But there's a yeah. real ch challenge in terms of training, because I, I gather that in fact we're now we Western navies are now very good at boarding operations. We're very good at that kind of thing. Mm. Constabulary operations have probably never been better. But what about anti-submarine warfare? Mm. What about anti-air warfare? What about the more sophisticated kind of anti-surface unit warfare? We're not quite so good, because we haven't exercised it. We haven't practiced it to the extent perhaps we ought to have done. And getting the balance right in your training is, I think, perhaps the major challenge because you've got to be good across the board, and that is difficult. It is very difficult to maintain those skills when those skills are not being tested. So you have to find ways of testing those skills in exercises and so on, and you have to make sure you can do this kind of thing properly. And, it, and, and this means that somebody somewhere the training, in the training uh, system has to make a, you know, and, and has to make a choice. You know, we need to get that right, and, and even if the boarding party isn't quite so good, you know, it needs to know how to use the sonar and the and then and coordinate the helicopter and so on. So, I think the big the, the, the big test is is training and training with vision, shall we say? You know, I'm, go ahead. No, no. The uh, you know, if, when I looked at your question of how do we measure capacity to win talked a bit about innovation training and what have you. The one thing I find that uh, staff to staff to staff uh, that I go to, that I think we have to, as maritime forces, continue to work our skills uh, is how do we assess how good we are? And to really be brutally honest associated with that assessment. I can't tell you even as a Pacific Fleet Commander, people want to come into uh, and tell me, well, we did exercise or operation Y, and it was most successful, sir. And I'll say, what the ham sandwich does that mean? <laughs> and that's when we start getting uh, to the nitty gritty, and, and usually we gotta come back again, because we like to measure success in that, well, we completed the exercise, what more do you want, boss? Uh, versus really looking at it. And sometimes it's uh, the business of you do a war game and it can be a tabletop. It doesn't require a lot of sophistication, maybe some roll of dice and what have you. But then really looking from initial conditions and then brutally honest with a red team that, that, that gives you that hard piece that you don't want to hear because sometimes that brutal honesty might be a risk to a particular program that you're working hard. In fact, we sometimes call it the tyranny of the program versus what it's being designed to solve in the first place. And then the other piece that gets in the way sometimes is just that gung-ho, you know, we'll go in and kick their butt, sir, it doesn't matter. <laughs> How are you gonna handle this particular threat in this piece of really getting into that sophistication of, of, of opposition weaponry or approaches? because sometimes it's not so sophisticated. Think about, you know, and that's why I look at the land campaigns we've been involved in and say, hmm, what do we learn from it as a naval force? Pattern of life, ooh, that's something that, that gets into uh, what's going on in the maritime domain, not just maritime domain awareness in a ship X, Y, or Z is out there p floating on the pond, but how do you really get into the intellect pattern of life? You know, I got to go on a trip around Africa once. The whole continent there was pretty neat, you know, with the Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, Djibouti, and ultimately to Algeria. Algeria was very perplexing because at the same time we were getting our butt kicked in uh, dealing with IEDs. Well, I should connect it to South Africa because while I was in South Africa, they were telling me about their equivalent to these uh, MRAPs, you know, these. Uh, vehicles with the V-shape to take explosions. And he said, you know, you Americans aren't listening to us. And then our, bi bi our fatality count was going up uh, quite well. I go to Algeria and I'm, I'm going into the French and Algeria war, well, they had a museum. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting in how uh, we, they didn't call them IEDs there, et cetera, but the history was there sort of as my colleagues here have talked a lot about. And I said, you know, why don't we know this history? You know, why aren't we applying that? And then thinking of the technology solution. And then finally, you know, we came around the United States and Secretary of Defense, you know, just said, screw it, cut the chase, buy the things, yeah. and get them out there to protect our soldiers. 
Well, this same uh, piece, that's why I say this assessment of how good and, and, and what we need to, to get at it uh, is so important. And, and to me, you know, as I have carry strike groups and, and other ships that are deploying, it's always I'm asking their leadership, what homework assignment are you giving them as they're deploying out there to go work on and think about that's far reaching so that you can have more of this critical thinking we've been talking about. And then, as I say, being on it, brutally honest in the results is just so darn important. Or you can be developing the wrong thing or the wrong approach to the problem, and ultimately you can lose if you don't have that kind of capability. I often think, just as much as we were talking about how are we training from the beginning in various areas of appreciation for the diversity of the, of the, the globe, uh, this other piece I don't think as naval professionals we ch teach from the ground up is how to do <coughs> effective assessments, but yet it's so darn important. I'm going to take uh, one more question down here. Jamie Michael, SPC Power Center. The panel's touched on radical thinking, outside the box thinking, and risk. And I just want to get your idea. I mean, uh, Professor Grove touched on Tangier. That was a risky, strategically ambitious move that went not so well. Uh, the Gallipoli campaign, high risk, high return. Market Garden, high risk, high return. Uh, General Wolfe at Quebec, high risk, high return, actually came off. In an period where society is becoming more and more risk averse, in our profession where it is risky, how do we, or in your experience, how do we as leaders effectively manage risk in our area? Mm -hmm. You're all looking at me for that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, it's a, a great question uh, because risk is, is a piece that Everything we do has a certain quantity of risk associated with it. So then it's how is that, in fact, talked about. Uh, that's where, you know, in my last conversation of the go, uh, gung ho -ness versus the piece of intellectually, critically thinking about the issue to include risk analysis. Uh, if we go in and do X, Y, or Z as we work plans, what are the, what do we expect to occur most likely to less likely, and then what's the risk associated if those occur should be a part of our calculus uh, as we go in. We may guess as the predictability piece that was discussed up here earlier uh, wrong, but at least if we've gone through that calculus and we start seeing the indications, may afford us an opportunity to regroup and do it a different way. Uh, so this business of uh, having some risk analysis as part of the planning apparatus is, is, is just important to be included so that you, as we, we work through things. And that risk analysis is across the whole spectrum of how we operate. I mean, we all work and operate in a dangerous domain, even when somebody's not shooting at us. Uh, when I look at, uh, while I was here following uh, uh, one particular typhoon in terms of which way was it going to go and where was my fleet assets, uh, not just uh, surface ships or submarines, aircraft and what have you, and how was I going to have them dispersed uh, in order to avoid calamity from that perspective uh, is a risk computation that's costly if you get it wrong to the risk of uh, dealing with that range of mission, military options uh, to ensure that you're able to sound off, okay, sir, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z. That's, I'm in uniform. That's what I get paid to do to go in harm's way. But at least make sure you understand this may not go so well for us uh, based upon what we're going to take in terms of the approach. Are we sure we want to do it that way? Or is there another approach that we should be taking? So I, I think uh, risk has to be in every conversation. Thank you. Just, just, just two, mm. two very brief, brief comments. One is um, I don't know that we're living in, in a more inevitably more risk-averse environment. I, I'll, I'll concede that today uh, we are more risk-averse, but I don't know that that's a secular trend. I, I don't think we, you know, I, I, 
I think it's very, you know, the, the historian in me, I, I think it's very easy for me to see a situation where certainly in the United States we would, uh, given, given a, a pressing threat, be willing to accept much greater risk. So I don't, I don't concede that. Second, I would, I would differentiate uh, between different types of risk. And just for convenience, I would say, I would differentiate between operational or tactical risk, which I think you've, you've, is what you've tended to focus on, and strategic risk. And um, there are plenty of, you know, there are plenty of cases where what we've traded tactical risk for, for strategic risk. And I think, you know, that oftentimes in history, you know, officers have been called upon to carry out very tactically risky uh, courses of action because of the of this you know the strategic risks of inaction or the potential strategic rewards of, of tactical success. So. I'll give an example of that, and I can't resist it as a historian. Um, Nelson, mm -hmm. something has to be left to chance, and you remember his approach to uh, the French and the Spanish at Trafalgar was really risky because he was sort of heading in a direction that they could shoot at him, but he couldn't shoot at them. Um, but he tempered, tempered that by two things. First of all, with intelligence, trying to measure that risk. Um, in other words, knowing as much as he did about the French and Spanish, and he could assess the degree of risk that was involved in it. And the second was training, so that when the final position was reached, the superior training of British gunners would actually reverse any losing situation that had developed so far, which it certainly did. So, I, absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more with what's just been said by my two colleagues here, that, that risk is inevitable. And that's what the whole business is. That's what walking outside and catching a bus is, um, at least to some extent. The trick is to manage it. And the managing it requires sort of knowing what the situation is and training for it. If I can end on a, what I think is a hopeful note for most people in this room. Um, countries are uh, the Western... Major, the major Western nations are very risk averse at present in the sense that they don't want the kind of mission creep and the kind of uh, things that happened in uh, Iraq and Af Afghanistan. Um, boots on the ground are, 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 are no longer acceptable as a means for the time being, at least it may change of course again, uh, as uh, a, a means of choice in trying to affect uh, affairs ashore. We've seen it in the debate about Syria. In these circumstances, maritime forces come out pretty well. They can be poised, to use the British doctrinal term. Uh, they can be brought into an area. Perhaps they can be withdrawn again without the same kind of, uh, of political and strategic results, uh, and so on. And so this is actually a very good time for maritime forces. Mm. We're be even beginning to notice it in Britain, which is why uh, the Sea Lord and the Naval Staff are actually quite optimistic at the moment. This is a good time for navies, and it's a good time for navies because n a nations which wish to affect things ashore want to do it in the way which naval forces are best at doing, by standoff attack, by interdicting uh, supplies, etc., etc. So uh, I'm pretty optimistic at the moment, and I think you ought to be too, and I'm sure you have great careers ahead of you. <laughs> you know, there is this piece, though, that I think gets it, perhaps I didn't touch on your question, or maybe we didn't as well, is the political risks. You know, we started talking about strategic corporals, uh, particularly with Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, but recognizing that uh, the, uh, the actions we carry out ha have a political dimension and how well we understand that risk. It's one thing in terms of tactical risk. Can I sink him or make his warship or plane uh, non-effective against me? versus the, the, the long-term piece of uh, are my actions going to have a pol political dimension enough to s either deter or, or stop the conflict and give my national leadership more maneuver space, if you will, uh, as we make planning recommendations and what have you. So that piece from strategic to tactical, uh, but strategic also includes that political dimension that we have to be mindful of uh, uh, as we do our operations. In uh, 
drawing these proceedings to a close, I, I first just want to offer my, uh, my own personal thanks to our, our panellists for giving of their time this afternoon. And before asking you all to join me in, in thanking them, uh, I, I would like to single out one individual in particular. I, I do hope that the significance is not lost on you all that we have had at our disposal here a four-star admiral for over two, two hours now of that very precious time uh, to which he referred. Uh, so, sir, thank you very much for, uh, for freely giving of, of your time uh, for our benefit. And uh, uh, please join me in thanking all of our panellists for, uh, for our first Young Strategic Leaders Forum. <laughs>